Hi and welcome to Fit But Indoors. I'm Rebecca Gall and I'm with Andrew Ferguson and today we've got a special guest. Now last time we spoke about his school days, we spoke about his career and it was all accompanied with some music but today we're going to be talking about the football. So Stevie, if you'd like to introduce yourself. How you doing again? I'm Stevie Wilson, the uh, Drossel Wind Rovers manager uh, and again I'm delighted to, to uh, join you and um, go for our, our football, our footballers. Good to have you up. Thank you, thank you. So the first player you brought up was Mark Walters. Yeah. Tell us a bit about him, what, how he inspired you particularly. Um, again, it's a great, like I said it last time, with the, with the try to pick your songs, try to pick your five uh, players is, is, is ridiculous. Do you know what I mean? Try to, try to pick them. But again, I tried to pick people who kind of inspired me at certain stages of my, my, my life. and. Mark Walters was the kind of the first one I had uh, like posters all over my my, my room. I was what uh, went to Ibrooks. To, my dad took me to Ibrooks in nineteen eighty eight, and that was a kind of first time I, I kind of witnessed him and just walking into Ibrooks into the stadium and seeing him in the flesh, having all these posters in your your wall, and obviously watching him on the telly. But it, it was brilliant just to to see him in the flesh and how he moved and. Even when the ball was up the other end of the park, the type of things he actually done, and I, I, I just remember kind of being fixated on just watching him constant. Sometimes even watching the game, and when the ball was at the other end, he would deliberately go way right out onto the touchline and stand right on the line. Uh, and defenders, not sure whether they got way over towards him or or had their, had their shape and stuff like that. So I just loved that that whole kind of toying with defenders, and then again on the ball, just that kind of famous twist and turn they would. Faint, he put a delivery in with one foot and twist back on the other, and and then just just hang it up for back post area. I usually taking goalkeeper and defenders at the game, and the amount of times that people come in at the back post and just just put it in the back of the net. And the one that kind of stands out for me is a kind of iconic was obviously the the cross for the left hand side against Aberdeen. He won the league in I think it was a ninety one season, um, where he's kind of half fallen, but. He just puts a, a ball in for Mark Cately to, to, to go and win the header. And, uh, and that's just one of those iconic moments for growing up. So I, I just loved kind of the type of players. Like obviously, even on loud up and all that stuff of quality. But again, he was the kind of first one that, that kind of stood out for me as a, as a kid. And especially going to Ibrox kind of for my first time, that, that kind of feeling and, and, and watching him in the flesh. Um, was just exciting. Um, so that's so how Mark Walters, as I said, was what kind of one of my, my first ones that was that, that I kind of really looked to and inspired me at that time. It's a different experience watching a player live like that, isn't it? But you can watch them on TV, you can uh-huh. see it all, and you just kind of follow the full game. When you're there live, you can yeah. watch this player, see what he does. You don't think about how exactly it is. But... Yeah, you're one hundred percent right to, to watch them in the flesh because. The TV cameras are obviously following the ball and stuff like that. You do see a bit of the pundit chain and stuff like that, but they're only showing you highlights of games. When you're actually watching a player live and you can just kind of concentrate on a player and his movement and uh, the things he used to do, and a lot of things that Matt Waters done was just, it was always up here and just mm-hmm. trying to fill defenders and try to drag them out in areas and stuff like that. And then, as I said, that kind of, I love that twist and turn that fake. Yeah. Cross into the box and then cut back on his other one and, and, and again he could go left and right, he could go and play either side. Obviously I remember he's uh, when he played against Sale taking the one five one and he scored the, 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 the fifth goal and I think that was Ray Wilkins scored the, the volley for the for the edge of the box, you know what I mean? But yeah, Matt Walters was was, was exciting back then. That was that was one I, I loved watching. He, he was one of the players, like even during like the times, he, he, he did receive like quite a lot of racial abuse. I think football is quite a good thing to show like the awareness of it. Obviously, just now with the players taking a knee and everything for Black Lives Matters, and obviously the show racism and red cards. I think it's quite important for like football to show their awareness for social issues like that. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think football is a platform for a lot of things like that mm-hmm. uh, regarding like racism. Probably a lot, of, a lot of players within the, the women's game and the, the men's game regarding um, 
uh, being gay and stuff like that. And, and football is a game for everybody. And as you said, it, it, it does it's a great opportunity regarding the football side of things to to really promote and, and help these, these, these issues that, that we do have. And as you said, back then, what uh, Mark Walters uh, took a lot, do you know what I mean, back at, back in that period. And, and we've well moved on. Um, obviously, we still have got work ahead of us regarding getting that out of football, but we, we have moved on a, a lot since then, do you know what I mean? The stuff that was, mm. it was thrown at the sides and stuff like that. But really? no, you're right, pl- uh, football's a great plan, pl- platform for for, all, for a lot of these these type of things, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So obviously, like being a, a, a manager as well, like you're looking at players and seeing kind of attributes that you kind of want into your team. If you were to look at, if you were like to scout Mark, what would be like the three attributes you would take from him as a player? Probably his bravery, just constantly wanting to get on a ball. Again, as you said, being, being a manager, there's certain things in certain areas of the park, and the, the way I kind of. I like my, my attacking players to just go and play with a freedom. I hate having players on a type of leash. The way I kind of work just now is I'll, I'll say to the boys, listen, defensively we'll be solid. Um, midfield will be very, very workmanlike and, and, and be able to be on the ball. And when you go and play these bigger teams, you'll say to them to be, to be brave um, and be comfortable on the ball. But I'll always say to my teams, and I, and I still say it uh, just now, is in the final third, I want to be entertained myself. I don't want to put a leash on the players and tell them to play how I'll say to them, listen, in the final third, go go and express yourself, go and do what you want to go and do. If you're out wide and you want to come inside the park, then come inside the park. If you're a striker and, and you want to get a shot away, go and get a shot away, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna have a go at you. And I like to play with that freedom and but I'll say to them to play in the right areas of the park. But when they get forward, I'll, I'll usually say to the players, listen, go go and go and play. I've had team talks where I've come in with boys. I am bored stuff watching you. <laughs> uh, I want you to go and I want you to go and do something. I want somebody to try and grab a game with a scruff for the neck and you know we play a kind of a three up front at the moment with two kind of slightly wider guys. And I'll say to them, listen, go go and play, go and interchange, go and uh, swap over with each other and cause cause uh, defenders problems. Because that's what we always say, make defenders defend, uh, make them think, um, don't just stand there and be easy, easily marked, move them about. So, yeah, and I mean, like so guys like Mark Walters and stuff like that, 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 that's the things that would stand out for me. Playing left, playing right, dinking balls in uh, from a right, from a left, that fake uh, and chipping in with goals as well. So, exciting, really exciting. And that's something that's always always sticks to me. And as I say to the boys, go and play, just go and play in the final third, as long as we do everything right in other areas of the park. He was the type of player to go take a game by the scruff of the neck as well, wasn't he? Aye, the amount of times you just popped up with something and as you said, the amount of times obviously goalkeeper coming to his near post, getting to the byline, defender trying to, and I mean you see boys now putting balls in and they're trying to whip things across the feet, hitting the first defender, that, that, that does not, he done, do you know what I mean? That, <laughs> And the amount of times you, you see guys getting the back and you're saying, and I was I was kind of taught that when I went to Adros myself because I played the right hand side for a spell. And our old manager at the time was uh, David McKellar who played with the Angels and, and stuff like that and Carlisle. And he used to always say to me, get, out, get to the byline and dink it back door uh, for the deep guy coming in because everybody gets dragged. Most will get dragged to the front post area, uh, your goalkeeper, your defenders. And if your runners are coming in, you should have somebody trying to come in deep, so, but you don't, you don't see that a lot now, they're, they're all trying to whip it and uh, try to do, do fancy things with it now, do you know what I mean, and just keep it simple and the amount of goals that Matt Walters set up and chipped in himself when, that, that, uh, when, when he was there was, was brilliant, I was devastated when he left to go to uh, Liverpool, but always, always kind of followed his career. And like obviously when we were talking last time you were saying like, when you played you liked the good crunching tacos, like the aggression, the dirty side of it. And the next person we're talking yeah. about is Terry Harlock. He was one of their players, oh, wasn't he? Very different. <laughs> Loved him. He was only he was only there a season. I only played what twenty nine games. I think he scored two goals, one against Celtic. Um, but he was he was a warrior. <laughs> what you've got is you've got in the game guys that can go money games, like say so you like your goal scorers and stuff like that. Or, but Terry Hillock, sometimes a crunching 50-50 tackle is just as good as, get, as, as scoring a goal. 
and especially being in the junior game, I remember coming into the junior game myself and, and having to go into the type of tackles and probably stronger back then. And I remember coming into the game playing against um, uh, Tommy Turner, who was a, a warrior in his time with St Johnstone and St Martin and Patrick Thistle. Um, and he ended up at Johnstone Borough. And when I was at Bemba, um, he played at Johnstone Borough. Like in the latter stages of his days, I think he was maybe in his 40s at the time. And he was playing middle of the park and he was he was old school. He was laying studs on you and the two of us were having a right good go each other. I was only 20, 22, 23 and he's smashing it to me and I'm smashing it to him and he's digging me and scratching me and all that stuff. And, and then it ended up, I went through one of them with a goalkeeper and the goalkeeper ended up injured and they never done a goalkeeper on the bench and Tommy Turner went in. And uh, in just about five minutes to go, I've ran through and Tommy's came out and I've lobbed him. And I thought, I've just set him off here. He was going mental. I thought he's going to kill me after this game. Uh, and do you know that he came up to me after the game and he put his arm around me and he said, do you know what, wee man? That was old school. That's what football was all about. And I loved it. And I loved that place. And I was that type that I would rattle into tackles and all that stuff. And Terry Hullock back then just when you see him crunching into some of these tackles, you were just like, it just gave, like the stadium, just woof, this roar. And then you would see players run about, just start to, 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 to lift. And as I said, that's as, that's as good as, as good as uh, getting a goal. And even a, even a goalkeeper making a save. Um, our goalkeeper last year, Blair uh, Lockhead, he won play the year for us. Um, and the, bit, off the top of my head, there's about two or three games I can remember that you're thinking is a certain goal and he makes the save and we near enough immediately go up the other end of the park and score. And you see that with a lot of football you know, over the years, like somebody will miss a chance and somebody will go right up because it gives you that that boost. Somebody's made a save or it's a last ditch tackle. Or, yeah. And and that's, that's, that's the thing that's kind of going out the game a wee bit that, that, that's annoying because now it's all more non-contact stuff or getting close to that type of thing but back then Terry Butcher was uh, sorry uh, Terry Hullock was was a kind of hero of mine and I remember uh, Neil Ruddock um, getting asked a question and he was asked what's your favourite animal and he says Terry Hullock and, <laughs> uh, and that's just something that, that, that sticks I mean as I said he was only there he only played 29 games or something like that but mm. I just loved his enthusiasm and his, uh, the way he would crunch into tackles and stuff like that, you know. And that, that's the thing we have all with it, with it, mm-hmm. with, the, with the juniors. I remember when we played we played Rangers at Ardrossan. And again, it was through David McKellar, who was uh, an ex-Rangers player. They got a Rangers, basically a Rangers youth team came down. Um, he plays at Winton Park. And um, I remember playing Wade Wright that night. And the boy was up against him, I won't mention his name, but it was only a youth team, the Rangers youth team at the time. And John Brown was a, the manager of the, the youth team. So I remember the wee guy saying to me, um, just before kickoff, he says, hey big man, hey big man, is it true all you junior guys just go about killing people? So, and I turned around and said to the wee man, I says, aye pal, that's, that's exactly what we do. So the next minute he runs into his wee set of hoffies like that, it's true, it's true, they're going to kill us, they're going to kill us. So, <laughs> and I remember getting into a tackle just in front of the dugout where John Brown was. And again, when I said the last time, it was obviously the nine in a row team. Bomber Brown was a, a big player, like mm-hmm. Terry Hullock, batting into tackles. And I remember John Brown screaming and shouting at me because I, I went into this crunching tackle. And I kind of remember what he said, but I just remember standing there shooting, thinking to myself, John Brown shouting at me, John Brown shouting at me. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the type of things. As I said, they can change games. So you need your guys in that middle of the park. As I said, and Terry, Terry Hollock was was one I loved. I say it speaks for the impact that that type of player can have in a team. That you say it was he played twenty nine games one season, and you're still yeah. talking about him as a, such a big influence on yourself. Yeah, yeah, massive. Again, you see that yeah, the midfielders like we have Roy Keynes and all that stuff. Terry Hollock was one. I kind of done it myself. Again, you learn that coming into junior game. You learn more for players than you do for managers. Now, I'll always say that. I'll always 
they argue that because the amount of boys that when I came into the winning team as a, as a young 20 year old full of experienced guys Chrissy uh, Chrissy Dougal uh, E. McMullen Kirky Cookie all these guys would take you aside and say what, what are you doing this for what are you doing that do this and do that and as I said I loved the tackles and sometimes you'd actually delay your tackle slightly mm-hmm. if you knew you were 100% getting it you would delay it slightly so you could catch the man as well uh, <laughs> and I know <laughs> I know that's not how football uh, goes these days but that, that's that's what it was like especially junior game especially mm-hmm. junior game uh, you had to you had to be able to, to do that and as I said even before my time was even I think it was even worse than that um, but we had, we had good guys and these guys would tell you listen do this make sure you protect yourself and and stuff like that. But yeah, as you say, these these type of guys are in because if you, if you've got ball players and if you can't if they know that if they don't really go into tackles and try and get it, then how are you getting them on it? You need somebody that's going to do do the do the dirty work and they accept or probably their job is to get it for the others. And 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 that, that was it. And that, that was probably one of my roles at, at, at when, when I played as well. Get it back, go and get it and get it. We do give a We do give a I used to say to me and play great. Uh, so I'll take Coventry and stuff like that and it was up at Winton and he said to me one time he says when you go to the crunching tackles the hairs in the back of my neck stand up he says I couldn't do what you do and I was like well I can't do what you do so uh, I'll get you and you just go and do what you need to do and, uh, and, and that's it and that, that's what it is so if you get a team you can't have a team of the exact same players the, the team's got to be balanced at who's going to do the running who's going to do the work who's going to do the, the ugly side of the game and then when we need that bit of quality who's going to stand out with that but yeah, Terry Hallett was was uh, one that stood out for me, that's for sure. I was just going to say, it must give those flair players like the confidence to go and do their thing, knowing that oh, I've got a player like Terry Hallett behind me. If mm-hmm. I lose this ball, if I try something that doesn't work out, I've got the players there that will win it back. Yeah, you've, you've, you've always got that balance. As I said, you had, uh, like Roy Keane and stuff like that back in the day that were going to do that for, for Manchester United. Um, you, you had players like Ian Ferguson at, at Rangers they could play they could still play they were good players do you know what I mean you don't get to go and play at the top yeah. level in professional football but they were your guys they were your guys that you could turn to and you, if you knew even again when I played if I knew certain players were playing beside me I knew he, he's got my back everything's fine and it was again it's playing the game up here at times it's not always about how fit you are and how good you are it's about up here and again, I remember playing with big Chrissy Dougal, who was playing with the Meda and stuff like that. And he um, was coming to the end of these days at the Winton. And I remember being a midfielder, maybe dropping back into that back line to pick my, my man up. And big Chrissy Dougal used to go, ah, get the hell away from me. Get into that middle of the park. Nobody's going to beat me in the air. I'll win every header, don't you worry about that. And you see the guys run about thinking, hmm, right, okay. And the amount of times he did want it, and then I would just be in the hole because at times I'm like, well, I'm not really picking anybody up. But he would win it and I would pick it up. And then all of a sudden, the guy that's maybe thinking, I'll push on, is thinking, mm, I better drop back a wee bit. So all of a sudden, you're starting to force players back. And that's what you say, even nowadays, is about, listen, take the gamble, force your man back, try and get into his head. Don't just sit and be easy marker. You need to go and, go and express yourself and go and force these guys back. So that, that at any level of football, that if it, for boys club right through that, that doesn't really change it just the change, what changes as you go higher up is they do things everything's done quicker you know what i mean and and, and sharper and a wee bit more thing we are up here mm-hmm. but it's still the same principle of football do you know what i mean yeah it's definitely a mental game it, it is that thing it's like the first tackle is the most crucial like, as soon as you've got in their head they ball people just don't know what to do they don't want the ball near if you're on like their tails and like that it, it's very crucial in the game yeah, again, I would, I would see if I was having a poor game. But again, I, again, a, a big Kirk in my team who again was well in his thirties when I when I joined, and, and he used to say to me as a central midfielder, as a central midfielder, you must be booked every game. If you're not booked every game, you're not doing your job right. You think, right, okay. So, and that's the, that's the things that that, that that stick with you. When I was in that dressing room at the time, and I just you're, you're like a sponge. You're trying to take all of this stuff in you know and uh, and as you say these, these type of guys are all influential in, in, in how a game's games won and if I had a poor game myself I knew 
I need to go and find a tackle. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to pick up a booking somewhere, but I need something to get me going. And I'll still say to the boys today, in the first five minutes, I'll say to the defenders, go and win your headers, go and win that first header, get, get that tackle in, go and get the first tackle in. Your, your strikers, get a shot away early. First five minutes, get, get something away, get a shot away. Uh, midfield, go and get a tackle, whatever you need to get you going, go and find it. Don't let it come to you and it's 10, 15, 20 minutes down the line. Mm-hmm. If you need to go and find it, go and get it. Get yourself self-motivated and go and get what you need. And I, I, I was the same as a player. If I wasn't playing well, I would um, I would go and find a tackle and say, right, right that's me. That's me ready to go. Picked up the book and I'm a wee bit, a bit hunger, a bit of desire, a wee bit of anger about me now. And then you would maybe more on. You know what I mean? So that is, it's a mental thing. You think, you know what it's like as well? You th- think, well, I played last week and I won. What did I have for my breakfast? They'll have the same thing again. What boxer shorts? I'll <laughs> wear the same boxer shorts again. <laughs> uh, did I do that? Did I have a banana for the, before the game? So it's that thing that goes into your head that you start. Nothing to do with training or how you. How you it's these wee things that players will. Certain guys get dressed the same way with right boot on, left boot, and whatever way, and stuff like that. Um, we had a boy. Uh, <laughs> uh, his pre match. His pre-match was, he had to go to the toilet, right? But he could only go to the toilet if he had something to read. Right? Right. If he had nothing to read, he could do it. So I remember he was playing at Coburnley and like, he was like, ah, yeah. so every game he, he had to go to the toilet, whether it was a match day programme or a paper or something. And uh, and, he's got, and he's like, I need something to read, I need something to read. I'm like, there's nothing. And uh, we, were away for, we were playing at Coburnley, so there, there was, we were obviously away. And uh, he's like, you need to get me something to read, you need to get me something to read. And the next one, the one I came out again, came in all panic. He's like, I can only find the, the local kebab shop menu. <laughs> and he was like, that'll do me, give me it. And I went to the toilet to read. That was his, that was his pre-match. Uh, and he, he always had to have something to read. Um, <laughs> he's like, and this was about 10, 15 minutes before going out onto the park. Uh, and that was his pre-match. Uh, and that was that was a way back then. So guys have got their different things, you know. Um, How about yourself? Did you have any? Not well. I had a pair of. I've still got them right now. Uh, a pair of Rangers. A, a pair of Rangers tartan boxer shorts. Right. Nice. That I had for when I, I know when I had for when I was like at boys club. And then right through into my, my junior days, right up until when I, I stopped. I see I've still got them just now, but they were like thread bare. And I actually had to get my mum to, she was sewing them. She's like, there's nothing to sew. That these things were like, they were bogging, they're black and brown and all sorts, you know what I mean? But I just always wore them. And then if I had a poor game or for some reason I didn't have them or whatever, you always thought, uh, if not, it's because I've not had my boxers on or, this and that, but that was one that I just always just uh, uh, that, that was the only one I, I really had. Um, these things are important though, as a player, it gives you that wee boost, it gives you that something to kind of cling to before a game. Yeah, well, th- th- certain guys, my assistant Neil Greenwood, just now, um, like he's, <laughs> he's got a thing like, um, so say you're sponsored by I, I like Macron or before or Joma. Like he's got to have everything macro on. Like he can't have like a Joma tracky bottoms and or or if he's wearing Nike, it's got to be on Nike and stuff like that. He's got that and and like if the cones, he's got to have the cones like or the reds and all the yellows and all the greens. And sometimes the boys will just uh, mess all the cones up just to noise them up. <laughs> and he'll come in like, that. who's done that? The cones that that and that. He's, but that's his preparation as well. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But as you said, people have got there. Or routines and um, it's just one of those things you can't really mess about with that. That's uh, how players feel and what makes them comfortable. Um, so that, that's what I've got to do. I've, I've always tried to like kind of steer away from it. I'm like, my superstition is not to have a superstition because I think if I get into it, I'm stuck in that routine. Then it, <laughs> is that is that it's hard. yourself if you don't do it as well? Hmm. You know, if, if you don't do it and then you lose the game. It's on you, almost, <laughs> yourself. It's back, as you said, it's back to that mental thing. Aye. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. It, it's that the game's played 
more with that and how how you feel before a game and how you feel in the warm up. And sometimes you remember you you know what it's like. You'll be the same. You go to that warm up, your touch isn't quite there, and you start to oh, what's what's that? I don't feel as the, the way I should, or I didn't feel as good as I felt last week. But, but why? And as you said, I, I went here and I went. I didn't have beans and toast. That's why I had that <laughs> beans and toast last week, and I didn't have it this week, or or whatever. I think I think the only thing is some of the boys when I was at Irvine Vicks, um, big Kevin Adel. Um, I think his pre-match was he scored the hat trick, and all of a sudden he's like, I need to have a subway every Saturday, and I'm like, no, 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 no. And he's like, I scored the hat, I need to have a subway, like, no, 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 no. Uh, but guys have got their, their, their pre-match and, and how they go think about things, and you'll, you'll, you'll be the same, Rebecca. Mm-hmm. Aye. I, it's always coming out away from a game, and it's like, oh, that's because I've had that that day, and it's just, you need to keep doing it. Then, like, there was one game, I think it was against Hamilton or something, I played pretty good, and I was like, oh, that was a good game. And I literally had a pot noodle before it, so that was me. I was like, right, it's pot noodles, that's what it's got to be. <laughs> oh. That's it. That's it. <laughs> that's the smallest things. <laughs> I know. I know. But, um, aye, so the next one you've got is Ronald Coleman. We're moving away from the Rangers, guys. <laughs> mm-hmm. Aye, uh, the Ronald Coleman was, well, the thing is with Ronald Coleman, I remember I used to go to uh, in Holland in my gran every year. And I would, do, I would actually, I was lucky because I used to go to, I used to go one in about May, so I'd get taken out of school early. And I'd go uh, around about May time, end of May. And then I would go with my mum and dad later on in the year, maybe August, September time. So I was lucky in that sense. But my grand, we used to always go to Spain. And we're only far from Barcelona, so we get a tour. And it was 92. I remember being there um, when Ronald Koeman, you know, Barcelona team, played uh, at Wembley in the European Cup in 1992 and I remember sitting in a bar watching it and just seeing Koeman and that kind of ball playing centre half striding out with it and playing diagonals, his free kicks that he scored and obviously that that um, 92 European Cup he scored the next time against Sampdoria, the free kick mm-hmm. and I just remember like the whole of Spain because we were on the far from Barcelona, just going crazy. The bars were opened on eight. Again, it was only about twelve, but it was the they were celebrating or the waiters or the, the hotel staff, the cars outside with the flags and the beat the horn and and I've not had never kind of experienced uh, that in a foreign country, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so that that the Barcelona team was was um, a, a team at that point that I just loved watching them and, and Koeman was one of the big, strong, again, defender, could go and defend when he had to defend, but strider out that you talk about ball playing centre halves nowadays, they've been in the game for forever, these these guys, you know what I mean? Um, and, and as I said, Koeman was, was one of the type of players and uh, again, I just loved, I, th- I think he had, what, what was it, 100 and... I think it was like 67 goals in 190 games mm-hmm. for a set and a half. And his free kicks, they are actually reminded of, obviously he was before the time, but like Sir George Alberts, they kind of bullet uh, free kicks. It wasn't curved in uh, any top corners or whatever. really hard. Aye, something they just, it was just power. And it was, the goalkeepers were going the right way, but it was just the power and she accuracy it was beating them. They were meeting it in the way back out, they were meaning to get something on it in the way in. Uh, so I just loved that, he just, they, they kind of, he just done the big straight run-ups. They, they, they kind of bent run-ups and all that, and just poof. And um, and I just, I, I loved, I loved that type of thing as well. So, I Koeman was one, and as I said, for that point on, I always remember getting Barcelona strips and uh, no, no, your fake ones that you get the wee, the beach shorts. I would actually get my granny granny, right, we need to find a real, a real uh, shop and we would end up getting them either for the, the stadium and stuff like that. But I was a big kind of Barcelona fan at that point um, with, with Koeman. Big thing with Koeman as well, he's one of the players, very successful move into management as well, since retiring. I mean, uh, I remember watching him when, when he was in charge of Southampton and like that's yeah. what he did with that team was phenomenal. Yeah. And now, Barcelona manager. Barcelona, I know. I think he got a wee bit of stigma when he was obviously at Everton, but 
Mm-hmm. That's just the way some of these kind of clubs go now nowadays with, the, with these managers. It's just like if you don't get instant success, with, yeah, you can go out the door. But no, I mean, as you said, at Southampton, um, he done he done really well, um, and then obviously uh, being a manager at, at Holland, uh, national national team, and then going on to uh, Barcelona. So yeah, he's he's done he's done really well. As I said, not not always great players make make good managers, but he's obviously uh, went down that road and and, uh, and and doing really well now. You were saying there about his free kicks and stuff like that. Like when you are doing your set plays with your team, what is like the kind of things that you kind of look into? Like what are the players and stuff like that? Like how do you go about making out the set plays for your team? Well, we we usually try and, and, and come up with kind of some set plays. The boys usually kind of um, sometimes laugh about it because. To, to be hitting targets and uh, scoring goals is, is I mean, it's, it's, I've seen players doing it, but it's, it's, not, it's not every week it happens, you know what I mean? And you're thinking about a three kicks you get around about that box. So there's three kicks we kind of work on. Um, we listen, let's, if you're confident maybe hitting target, then fine. But if we're not hitting target, we need to try and work something. I hate just seeing a, a guy standing over it. I hate just watching uh, a static box and a that static wall and, and everybody just knows well he's going to have a shot here and he shoots and it goes over but I hate that and what I'll usually say to the boys is run about and, and, and they, they kind of laugh when they say that when I say run about because we scored a couple of a, a few cat and goals last season and we've done it before we worked in a couple of corners with one going down the outside of the box one coming inside the box uh, the wall sorry one going down the outside of the wall one coming inside the wall and getting our defender and attackers to start really deep to try and open up spaces. And again, all it's really doing is, is getting this. If you're in a wall and somebody's coming on one side of it, is the wall's then thinking, do I want to be breaking off or do I just want to stay? Who's matching him? And we had three over it. We, we scored against Mike Lennox, who scored a free kick last season. But we're at the edge of the box, the right hand side. And one runs down the outside of the wall and one comes inside of the wall and the guy on the wall broke off to pick the runner and Mick Lennox put it at the bottom corner round by where the boy had broke off the wall and it's on YouTube one of the, it's, it's actually on the, one of the games it was it was videoed and I said to the boys see run about mm-hmm. just run about and make them think what is something happening are they trying to work something are they going to be shooting You've even got the choice of trying to reverse it on either the outside of what if the wall doesn't break and you've got a runner, play it on the outside of the wall. So we, we do try and work on things like that. It doesn't always come off and sometimes you can look silly, but it's about the boys carrying out and being confident. But yeah, it does annoy me in just hitting a shot over a bar somewhere or hitting a wall. Mm. I mean, it's a good chance to try and work something. Um, so I usually say to the boys, listen, if somebody's really confident at hitting target, then okay. But otherwise, let, let's try and work something and see if we can we can work something out of it. But most of the time, it's a case of run about up there. Getting in the defenders' heads, give them something else to think about. Aye, yeah. You should say that a wall. Aye, yeah. a, a wall standing there, goalkeeper standing there, all the defenders picking up the attackers. Mm-hmm. Even your own attackers know, he's just going to kick, he's just going to hit this. Mm-hmm. And nobody, everybody's just waiting. Okay, if he hits top bin, fair enough. But as I said, he could probably hit 10 of them and maybe only score one, mm-hmm. two of them. Do you know what I mean? And the amount of times you're getting in the areas and, and collecting free kicks, you can't consistently be wasting them. So, mm-hmm. yeah, usually I, I would like to see a bit of movement and just just to, to see what you can what you can do. And again, it's maybe saying to the boys, listen, sometimes play what we see, even though you're marking down a, a, an exercise, Try and play instinctively. If you see that or that run, play it. Don't don't be worrying about making a mistake. That's the thing. I think so many players now are worried about mm-hmm. more about making mistakes mm-hmm. than taking the gamble. I've had players come to me and say, "Well, see, why did you not make that run? Or, well, I was going to make that run, but but if I if I did, he would." And I'm like, "Don't play the game if nobody. You can't play a game of football on went if if you'd done that." then that would happen. If you make that run, then he's going to defend you. No, if you do that, he gets in. Don't think negative, think positive. 
again, coming back to that, into somebody said, try to take that gamble all the time. So that's why I try and encourage the boys, be brave, take the gamble, uh, be confident, um, take the game with them. Um, do something special, entertain. Supporters pay the money, entertain. I don't want to sit there and watch regimented football. Don't you go there and don't you go there. Go and play with our freedom. Oh, definitely. And then obviously another Barcelona player that you picked was uh, Risto Stoichkov. I've probably butchered that name. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Risto Stoichkov. Again, in that team at that time, he was probably more looking uh, like Cumin and as I said, 12, 13 at the time. And, what, and then just starting to regularly watch that Barcelona side. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and Stoichkov was just, kind of just, uh, always a step ahead of the play, other players, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. A, a real step ahead. Uh, you could see he's intelligent. Again, if you watch a lot of his goals, he, he takes defenders really wide to open up. He knows exactly where he wants to go. He'll take them wide, knowing he wants the ball through the middle. And a lot of his goals come from his runs from outside in, mm-hmm. on both sides, starting in a wider area, and a ball play through, and him running, running in. And again, he loved. He, I don't know. He just loved chipping goalkeepers, and I don't know about you, Rebecca, but goalkeepers hate getting chipped. Man, even my goalkeepers go from nut. They kick balls away, and if, if somebody chips them, or tries to even chip them. Mm-hmm. Um, but he had that death delicate touch at times where defenders are coming and trying to crunch him and he just step inside and just flick it by the goalkeeper or, uh, and as I said he, he chipped him as well and out the 94 World Cup in USA was probably the World Cup I was like right in there. I tell you 90 I, I like but I was, I was still I was only about 10 but the 94 World Cup was like one of the World Cups where I was like this is Amazing because all the games were on it late at night, we staying up during the night, the American kickoff times, uh, and watching every game. Just remember watching every single game and loving it. And uh, and, and Stoichkov, I think he scored a, a free kick against Germany, and he scored an early goal against Mexico. Uh, just a breakaway again. I mean, he's, his accuracy is shooting. I mean, a way way out kind of left and he just whips right across the goalkeeper on the other side you think I don't see many players nowadays doing something like that you know what I mean? he just, he? <laughs> honestly you kind of you, you watch some of these guys the things they used to do and Stoichkov was one and he was one I always kind of tried to you know, if, if, when I played my pals used to think I was I wanted to play <laughs> Stoichkov and again because I was getting Barcelona tops Mm-hmm. I would come back and all of a sudden I would start getting Stoichkov in the back and stuff like that, number eight. Uh, and he was very deceiving, he looked a wee bit chunky, but he could run, he, he had pace. Mm-hmm. I mean, his physique and stuff like that, I think he was labelled sometimes as being a bit lazy, but I think that was part of his, his, his game plan, he look lazy, he full defenders, like I've got him. And all of a sudden he would just spring into life and, and, and score goals, and again, all types of goals. Again, I would play left, play right, again, go and play with a freedom. He played up there with Lakes of Romario as well in that, that team in a bit of time. Brilliant to watch Lakes of Romario. I remember Romario and Babeto at the 94 World Cup as well. Amazing watching these these players play. And I don't even think you can coach or manage these type of players. Again, it's like Messi and Ronaldo. Mm-hmm. How do you tell Messi and Ronaldo hey, you're, you're doing that rhyme? <laughs> do, do it like this. I think it's a case of here. You just go out and you just go and do what you do. Do you know what I mean? And we'll build the rest of the team. Yeah. Aye. Build the rest of the team around about them and say, hey, you, you go for it. Like, you you know what you do. You've proved yourself, right? Just, like. <laughs> aye, exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so I was, um, I remember a game, I think, uh, last one I played Ma- Manchester United that I liked as well. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes you'd lose a, uh, his head and he would, he would go into some crazy tackles which which obviously I, I quite like as well. Okay. Do you feel like the passion has kind of like kind of been lost in football a wee bit there in recent days? Aye. Mm-hmm. It, it worries me. It worries me. Uh, I don't like keeping on about it because it is what it is and, and, and it's football and I, and I love football and but the, 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 the passion and 
the things that they used to do is going, but the thing is, it's, it's not going to go back to that. Yeah. I just think that I just think the whole. I don't know if it, I don't think it's necessarily football's fault. I don't know if it's like the world. Like you see a player talking to somebody, it's the, the cover of their to, to to speak to each other because there's people up reading and they don't feel comfortable talking. When you speak to the press, they've got to watch what they say, which then, as I said, makes it robotic like, which yeah. like I said the last time that I don't, that's the side of the game that I don't like. It's one of the things I love about the junior game, mm-hmm. or is, is that whole passion and hunger and desire and tackles and there's an honesty, there's a real honesty about it. And there's boys I know that, that chopped going to uh, Ibrox and Parkhead. Uh, a boy I know like, I had a season ticket for Parkhead and, and, and gave it up to go and watch Pork. And he says, at Pork, I can get a pint, I can get a pie, I can walk around the park, I can shoot abuse if I want without anybody moaning at me. Uh, and it's it's 22 guys, honest guys on a park, having a go at each other. Uh, and, and, and you're getting to see some some good football and some tackles and mm-hmm. some refereeing decisions and and going him feeling as if I got my money's worth the other day at a five or six pound or whatever. And I think that's what what, what, what I love about the junior game. Uh, as I said, I used to go to Eagles a lot as a kid and and probably now if we had a free week or whatever, I'd probably go to a junior game more than maybe going to a senior game. Uh, and, and, and going back to obviously uh, what Andrew was saying earlier about there's nothing beats going to a live game and seeing mm-hmm. all the action and off the ball stuff, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that happens in the junior game as well. Um, and supporters get all wound up and singing songs to each other, do you know what I mean? But that, that, that's the side of the game. Uh, and the, the passion side in the senior game, as you said, it is, it is going a wee bit, but I try hard not to. To put it down that much because it's a game I love, but and it, and it, it is going that way. And mm-hmm. There's people I talked to well before my time when I and see the players are not the same. So I think it's that era. Yeah. And um, the era I came through, I loved. I loved you like ninth World Cup ninety uh, ninety four, uh, Euro ninety six. Um, I remember after World Cup ninety four, uh, sitting in the living room when the final was on and crying. And my dad was like, what are you crying for? And I was like, I need to wait another four years for another World Cup. <laughs> but it was every four years. And, and I was like, aye. And I was like, wow, four years? And I was like, that's, I'm like, I'm going to be 18 when the next World Cup starts and stuff like that. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't get to grips with that at the time. Uh, obviously, you've got the European Championships in between, which obviously cushions the blow, but. World Cups, but I don't think there's that kind of passion regarding the international side of things now. Obviously, it's brilliant that Scotland have they've qualified for the Euros. I hope I hope we can we can get get to see that and mm-hmm. and get that played. And if we can get some supporters back in, then that'd be brilliant. Um, I think you might see some more passion maybe with the supporters. The fact that they've been away for so long and maybe getting back. I hope so. Anyway, I hope so. I know it's always the fans that always make it. I love going to the junior games and just. You're hearing what the fans are shouting and all that, and even when it's the, the abuse or something, they're shouting. You're like laughing, but at the same time, you're not wanting to make eye contact in case they yeah. start turning on you or something like that. I know, I know. <laughs> again, a, a lot. Again, I did. I played at Dorai. Um, again, I think it was one of my first first season at, at, at Junior at Aldrossen. And my dad still goes to all the games. He still comes to all the games as well, and. Um, I, I've been the tackle just roughly about the halfway line, and from the stand, a walking stick came flying at me. I made a tackle, and it, it was a bit of a punch and tackle, but the boy threw his walking stick at me and just missed me. And I remember my dad's got one of the voices, he's up behind the goals, and I can hear him screaming, Hey, you! And I was like, Oh, no. <laughs> and my dad starts marching, marching round uh, to this old guy, and I'm like, oh, oh, here we go. But these are the things that the uh, I, I, I love, I love, that's the things I love about the junior game and the history mm-hmm. and the whole, it, it worries me the, the, the way some things football's, football's going, but they're, they're the things I love. I think what you said as well about how it gets very robotic, I thought it was really interesting hearing what uh, Jason Cummings said recently, did you see that interview? 
I did see that. He was I, talking well, about how when you are a bit of a character, sometimes if things aren't going your way, that gets pinpointed. And he thinks that being a bit of a dafty and having that bit of passion for the game has actually hindered his career. I think as um, a lot of players, you know, they're robotic. No, like, oh, good to get the three points. Fans were brilliant. Like, no one's, it's, it's boring. Do you know what I mean? Like, but that, that, that's kind of the way that you need to be these days. Because when you go the other way, like the way I go sometimes, and just be honest, speak, speak myself like I would speak to my mates or whatever, everyone just batters you. Characters in the game, um, the Gazas, like George Best and that, as soon as one comes along, you know, the moment you date, you have a bad game, they're on your back for it. Oh, he messes about too much. I feel like being yourself sometimes hinders that. Like managers for an outside will be like, oh, the boy Cummings is a bit, a bit of a dafty in his interviews or whatever. Um, and that's why the gaffer knows, he knows what I'm like. So I do take my job seriously, do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. There is that, they keep putting things like Footballers are role models, and footballers are role models, and stuff like that. I get that. They're young boys as well, do you know what I mean? They're young. The dressing rooms I had and came up through, some of them are so childish, it's unbelievable. But it's so funny. And some of the things that, that we used to do to each other, I kind of can't really uh, say some of them. But... We had great times and it was so funny and we still talk about things that we used to do to each other and um and it's just it's so childish. Mm. But to, to to be outside the dressing room, people think, oh geez, oh, you can't be acting like that. I mean, I don't know about you, Andrew or Rebecca, if you watch some of the podcasts with like Simon Ferry, I think done with some of these ex-players, it's a great insight. Because there's certain players that you think, I didn't know he was like that in a dressing room. Yep. And some of the stories and some of the things like so you hear, like Tommy Burns. Tommy Burns stories, every one of them talk about Tommy Burns and the stuff he used to do and how when he was at the first team, he was just constantly cracking jokes and, and winding players up. and and But that relaxed them. And having fun in a carry-on in a dressing room is about having fun and it is about players uh, finding their place in a dressing room and years gone by I've had players like maybe take poundings in a dressing room and you'll, you'll look at it and you'll, and you'll say right, it's okay he's, he's, he's alright there's maybe been a couple of times no many to be honest there's maybe been a couple of times I've maybe had to go to a couple of players take them aside and say hey back off him a wee bit just back off he's getting too much and, and it's maybe affecting his training or affecting his game time or how he's playing and his confidence is low, and uh, and I'm like, right, okay, anybody look after, and and then and then you, you just see them start to go, and then they settle down, and they find their place, and they can take the slagging, but they can dish it out as well. Um, but that's part and parcel of that. a dressing room. I love, I love, and I'll say to my assistant, even now, and uh, I've got Mo Armstrong in ways, and and Stevie O'Neill in ways working, and I'll say to them before we go into the dressing room, just stop, listen to the dressing room. And it's laughing and joking and carrying on. That's a good dressing room. And then they go into the park. It's the serious stuff. But uh, Cummings is right. Uh, in the senior game like that, it, I mean, people go, oh, he's half, he's not. I think he's done the, the, the whole cum dog thing with Hibs and jump about wrestling and the, uh, we, we they don't know that stuff. And it's funny. But as you said, anybody looking at him or maybe scouting him, I'm like, oh, uh, maybe he's not quite quite right upstairs and you'll maybe be a bit disruptive. Uh, that, 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 that's no fair because they, they need the they need the downtime as well. Do you know what I mean, the players? So, no, nah, I think you were 100% right with that. And that actually plays really well, talking about the, the laughing and joking. That plays really well into your last pick for your favourite players. Gaza? Yeah. Yeah, Begging Gaza. Hi. Yeah. Gaza was just an absolute idol. Everything seeing in my, my last interview about my school and how much football meant to me. Mm -hmm. I loved the laugh and a carry on and, and stuff like that. And that's why Gascoigne was just ticked every box for, for me in that sense, the things he used to do. At a point when he came in Rangers with the dyed hair, 
we went over to America to do a bit of coaching with Gail Gack um, and we took two teams over there and I lost a bet for it and I had to dye my hair blonde like, like Gaza. So I was in America uh, and Central Park and all that stuff in my hair, uh, bleach blonde. <laughs> Used to buy his boots and all that stuff and and just just loved them. I absolutely loved them. When we used to go down to Ibrox um, and see them, we would be always, as I say, trying to crack jokes or messing about with you, slap me around the back of the head. Uh, and just a, a very generous man as well. We used to go into some of the local pubs down at Justic Bar at Page Road West and he would, you know, you get these footballers that maybe sit there and people want to go and buy them drinks. Mm-hmm. He would go in and buy drinks for everybody else. But coming across Gascoigne was obviously the 90 World Cup. And the, the, the best thing about the 90, Italian 90 World Cup is the wee Coca-Cola balls you used to get. Um, you will probably do remember that, but you used to get the wee Coca-Cola balls and all those shops were selling them. And uh, if you get them with three bottles of Coke, it was Italian 90 Coca-Cola balls and all that. And you used to get all of them. And, uh, and obviously the, the Gascoigne thing with the uh, crying and stuff like that, it was something that kind of stuck with me. And then obviously came back for that World Cup and phew, that was... That was it. I remember watching the FA Cup final where he got injured against Forest. I was actually in a, my mum and dad were in a, we were in a TV rental show back then. And it was on, the FA Cup final was on the tellies and I sat and watched it while they were away shopping and stuff like that. Uh, I sat and watched in a TV rental shop, Gascoigne obviously picking up his, his injury and stuff like that. And then going to, going to Italy um, and Again, back then, you used to get all the Italian football on uh, Channel 4. And that was amazing, getting to watch the Italians play. Obviously, they talk, talk about the defending, but you're getting to watch the Milan Derby and stuff like that. And Gascoigne, obviously, picking up his, his injuries through there. And um, and then, obviously, I just couldn't believe when he signed for Rangers. I was just like, wow. Uh, mm-hmm. um, and, I just loved all that and obviously his Euro 96 goal against Scotland uh, and then his celebration doing a dentist chair when he scored uh, because he obviously gets stick when, when he was away but I think he was just always one of those guys that just when you talk about passion and stuff like that um, he was a guy that just played the game off the cuff he just done what he wanted to do nothing planned Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. And then I think I watched an interview where he even said that he'd done things and he would watch it back and say, how did I do that? You couldn't even believe yourself how he, how he actually had done some, some things. And and, and that, that, that was it. He was just, I think he's all, he's, he's classed as, I think he's got to be up there as one of England's uh, greatest players, but probably his injuries, uh, obviously hindered him a bit um, but I always remember I'll tell you a, a, a story I know I used to get I got his signed book when he was we left Rangers and came back up but um, was he still at Rangers? possibly because I was I was actually just started work and I used to always moan at my wee bra because I always I started working usually and I'm buying all the good clays and all that stuff and my wee bra was still at school and I used to always think Somebody's been in my wardrobe and I was saying to him, you're wearing my clothes? And he's like, no, 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 no. And I said to my mum and dad, he's wearing my stuff. And they're like, no, he's no, he's no. And he promises he's no. So he was in Waterstones in, in the town, in Glasgow, and I couldn't make it. And I said, no, you're going to go and get a, get a signed copy for me and all that stuff. And he was like, aye, aye, aye. So he went and got it and he got a picture with him. And he got a picture with him with my jumper on. <laughs> so that's how I managed to catch him out that he was wearing my clothes. <laughs> So it's him, him and Gascoigne, and he's got my jumper on, and I was like, ah, if you didn't wear him, oh, eh, 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 eh. <laughs> um, so that's how I managed to catch him out, so thanks to Gazza for that. Um, he but no, he, one. Aye, exactly, he helped me that way. But we went to the pavilion when they'd done the, an audience with Gascoigne, me, my dad, and my brother, and really emotional listening to him, talking about his time at Rangers, and he was getting upset. Um, and obviously, it was one of the guys I always knew when he starts playing football, he's going to really struggle because 
he's obviously more greatest than sleepers and I think he just basically sat up near enough all night just with his training gear on desperate to get to, to training so football I think was was everything for him do you know what I mean and, um, but I just loved him as I said tried to play like him tried to everything he done I tried to do I remember him before the World Cup wearing joggies with Timberland boots on I thought well if he can do that I'll do that <laughs> cruising about my, mate, my mates are like what are you doing and they uh, like, well, Gascoigne done it, so... Yeah, it was a quality player with a ball at his feet, though. Oh, unbelievable. Again, the Aberdeen games, the, the Aberdeen game, mm-hmm. where he picks it up around about that halfway line. I love the way he used his, just used his elbows and his, his arms to just hold off people. And as he started to drive, you don't... You don't see players doing that now. As I said, it's very much... Uh, I keep using the word, but regimented as in when you get here, you need to pass to that, and you need to pass. As I said, Gascoigne just decided he was picking it up and he would just drive, do you know what I mean? And he would just, he scored some wonder goals. He's, he had everything, his, his free kick you know, against Arsenal in the FA Cup semi-final. Um, I think it was voted um, the best goal at Wembley before they, obviously it was uh, flattened and the new Wembley belt, stuff like that. To have the kind of, the cockiness about him um, to flick it over Colin Hendry's head uh, at Euro 96 and collect it on the volley to put it by Andy Gorham. <laughs> uh, it speaks for itself as well, do you know what I mean? Um, so, nah, I loved all his, all his stories. And there's guys like, like that kind of bracket, probably held in that kind of bracket like some Maradona, uh, that just would pick it up and just run and just cause havoc for uh, for 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 defenders all the time, so they were they were the things. These guys just went and played with a freedom. Uh, most of these guys I'm talking about just just they just go and play, and that's that, that's the way I feel the game should be played. That that that's football to me. Just just go and express yourself. Don't worry about what could happen, uh, or what should happen. Uh, go and play instinctively. If you can go and make something happen, then you feel confident of going and taking it by two or three, then go and do it. Don't let, don't let anybody hold you back, do you know what I mean? If, if you want to do that, go and do it. Um, encourage that my wee boys team as well. We've got a couple of crack wee players, or some of them have moved on now, he actually Patrick Thistle. And um, we had one and he was left or right foot and loved dribbling. I would just encourage him, just say, just keep dribbling, just go by. As I said, sometimes it can look a bit greedy, maybe other parents will know you. Just, but you're trying to you're trying to encourage uh, these type of talents. And if and if this boy's got that talent, don't don't stop him for and say, well, you can't do that. You need to pass. Or he was maybe taking on two, three, four, five, six players, but doing it comfortably and and again and again and again. And I'm like, keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Just do what you think is, and he would, he was calm. In fact, Rangers and Celtic were, were looking at him, and a few of the scouts had said, what is he, is he right footed or left footed? And I went, I, I, I'm not actually too sure. And he's only 10. The boy's only 10, so I wasn't too sure. He was pretty comfortable on both. Um, but the type of things, like just go and, go and play, just go and play, go and feel what, and do what you feel comfortable, don't, think if I do this wrong is a manager going to shout at me or if I do this wrong is, is somebody going to moan at me because then all the good things that you do you stop doing and then you do things to make others happy and that, 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 that's, that, yeah. that, that's not what football's about to, for me and it's having that confidence like it's, it's so key and like obviously when you're saying about like these players having that freedom and just you just expressing themselves it's the ones that they'll get talked about as as the years go on you know like they have that ability and it's that's what you need it's, it's the confidence is the key thing just keep them going that, that's it but again you go back to like again you go back way back I think it was like as soon as at Liverpool and all that stuff and soon as same things like I think you went to Bob Paisley and how how do you want me to play and I think they were saying thing and Bob Paisley says if you're a Liverpool player, don't ever come and ask me how, how do I go and play football. If you don't know how to play, you shouldn't be here. But Alex Ferguson says because the time they come up to the first team, 
they need to make up their own minds. They need to know and learn themselves and not have a coach telling them all the time. And by the time they come to the first team, if they ever want to play in my team, they need to know how to play. Because I'm not going to be standing there telling them every two minutes, do this, do that. I want my team to go out and play. But I can see that whole sense of let them make their own mistakes, let them let them try and learn from it, and then, and then do your coaching after game or, or the Monday training or whatever and say, that's where you went wrong and that's what you should have done, do you understand? And, and I get that, I get that now, but that is about just trying to let them play, just trying to let them play, but there's probably too many coaches now trying to, trying to influence the kids too much, but you can't be over critical because a lot of coaches deserve a lot of credit, it's giving up their time to, to, to do it, and, uh, and without them we wouldn't have these your systems and all that stuff have got in place, so fair play to them. And I always remember like, when you were saying there about the parents always interfering. My first coach he used to always tell me because the parents would shout and everything, my mum was the worst for it. Every side of the pitch, didn't know much about football, but she'd be giving it and she would yell and everything. And I always remember my coach saying to me, Becca, just zone it out, just zone it out. And ever since that, I did not hear her, don't hear a peep from her. <laughs> she could be shouting bad and you know. <laughs> Aye, well that, that, that's it, that, that's it. Uh, and it is hard. It is hard as a as a parent. You you want your kid to do well, and you want to. Yeah. You, and it's not it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. Um. It's it's just it's trying to get that balance uh, and support, because as you say, without your mum and all that support, you, you you need that support as well, and that encouragement and stuff. Um. And 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 sometimes like. Sometimes coming home in the cars would be the chance to be have a wee chat. What do you think? Do you think? Oh, I'll do it my wee boy as well. I'll say, what do, what do you think? And I'll say certain things he'll say, oh, I thought I'd done that really well. And I'm like, right, okay, that's fine. Um, I'm saying, that's fine, try this and try that. And um, and it's just about trying to, as you said, trying to encourage them. There's so many pundits now uh, and so many shows that well, and talk about games and uh, they should have done this and should have done that and they should have had a transfer market and bought a centre half or should have done that and you can see some of these managers getting wound up because they're getting these questions week in week out clock starting to get a bit wound up Pep I think last season getting a bit wound up but when you start playing football you play it for fun you don't play with your pals in the park or the series and talking to each other but you play for fun and that's what i Try and you'll say to players as well. Remember when you played? Remember when it was fun? Try and remember that because that's when you probably, when you're at your happiest, is when you'll go and express yourself more. And it is about having that, but as you say, players knowing that the gaffer or the manager or the coaches have got my back. And yeah. if I make a mistake, then I'll be fine, I'll be all right. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I think that's a good way to kind of round it up. Well, we've got a wee quiz for you now to. I'm worried about this. I'm worried about Rebecca. <laughs> well, I did show it to Andrew and he said, I know about six. So we'll see what how you go on. <laughs> oh, no. So, we'll see. So, what's going to happen? It is on Scottish football, so we're keeping it quite niche. And you're going to have 60 seconds to see how many you can answer. And at the end of it, yeah. I want you to tag one of the, the Adros and Winton committee or a player or whoever you think can do better or do worse, whatever you feel. And we'll see, get them on next time to see if they can take the challenge, right? I can set a timer if you want. Uh, you set the timer then, Andrew. Yeah. Just go. give me a wee countdown. Right. Three, two, one. Who holds the record for most goals at Rangers? Uh, Alan McCoy. Right. Who won the Scottish Cup in 1998? 1998 Hearts. Yep. First Scotland first England game, 1872. The team was made up of entirely players from which club? Uh, Queen's Park. Right. Who was the manager of Scotland at the 1986 World Cup? 86. Uh, Ali McLeod. Right. Um, Queen of the South was located in which Scottish market town? Uh, Dumfries. Right. How many league titles has Scotland women's team Glasgow City won? Oh my god, Rebecca. <laughs> I had to put uh, the women down. <laughs> um, 
That's no good. Um, <laughs> Excuse the number. In so total. Many... Um, in consecutive. Uh, can I say, oh. That's that's six. <laughs> there what, you go. what is that? So you go one, two, three, four, four, in 60 seconds. Four? <laughs> is, that, is that many questions? I have? You had six there. Six questions. Wow. Oh. What's, uh, what's the ladies' team? It's, they had 13, 13 consecutive wins. Jesus. <laughs> that's bad. <laughs> I apologise for that, I'm sorry. No, no, I had to do it, I had to get some of the women's in. I've got a list of questions prepared, <laughs> no. and you probably get the same quite me in a minute. So. Quite right, quite right. <laughs> uh, no, that was good, that was good. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that, I appreciate that. Uh, who do you want to get on next time to see if they'll take the challenge? Um, What about if I get... I could get my, my brother. David Wilson, who is one of my well, one of my players and all my coaching staff just now, so I could get David Wilson. Hi, right, let's get him in then. See how we can beat you then. <laughs> See if you can beat it, and then he can nominate for there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. That's great. Well, thank you for coming on and having a chat with us. It was great to have you. I'm brilliant. I right, no problem. No, right, uh, thanks very much again having the time to, to talk about it. Definitely uh, good with this this lockdown and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Again, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Right, thank you. Well, we'll hopefully see you soon then and see what happens next. We. Yeah. Hey, Bola. Thank all you. The best. Thank you. Right, all the best. See you all later. The best. Cheers.